So unfortunately, melodrama in the X Mormon community is nothing new. It's always happening. But the one that really caught my attention what happened in the Mormon Stories podcast community, and that is with a young man by the name of Jackson Washburn. Uh, you're familiar with Jackson, aren't you, Bill? Yeah, I've interviewed Jackson uh, before. Um, he's a, a bright uh, young man. He uh, holds a lot of nuanced positions within Mormonism, uh, knows a lot of information uh, and intelligent uh, educated uh, i think he is the future of faithful mormonism that perspective is the future of why mormonism. why does he grate on people so much because the big melodrama that happened in the past week was that he posted some things that included the nuance that you're talking about and people seemed to be really really upset by it in the mormon stories podcast community what is it about people who come in with this nuanced perspective that seems to get former Mormons goat so much so that they feel almost hurt or attacked by it? Uh, good question. So, uh, by the way, do you allow swearing on your program, Jonathan? Uh, I, I don't do it that much, but I don't care. Okay. Well, I think <laughs> for post-Mormons, people out of the church, I think their bullshit meter uh, is a lot stronger. And, and here's what I mean. I like Jackson. I like Jackson as a human being. I think he's a, a great young man and I think he's a good person. What I think happens is that when people tried to hold nuanced positions, you can tell when they are internally trying to distance themselves from questions, avoid them, control kind of the areas the questions or the responses go into. And on this side of things, I can see through that. Like, when I ask questions about Joseph Smith's treasure digging or the book of Abraham or polyandry or polygamy or young brides, whatever the, the issue is in Mormonism, and there's hundreds of them, maybe thousands, um, you can tell when somebody knows that this is a messy area and they're trying to hold a faithful position, but they don't really want to be completely open, transparent to all of the data that's going on and kind of, be a, and kind of own and acknowledge where the church messes up and when it gets things wrong and when the critic has a better answer. And I think whether it's, you know, again, no offense to any of these guys, Patrick Mason, Terrell Givens, Richard Bushman, uh, Sam Brown, um, and, and add Jackson to that list, you can tell when these, these individuals are also trying to protect the church while at the same time be a, a higher level of honesty than the old standard of apologetics, uh, the way that that used to be done. Yeah. Well, it's kind of one of those things where I'd rather be locked in a room with Jackson than I would with Dan Peterson. Amen. <laughs> but um, the thing, I think one of the introspective moments of this, because a lot of people pushed back on some of the things Jackson was saying, and he tried to engage with them, and a lot of people felt like he was being snarky, dismissive, or outright rude in his responses, and he ended up backing away and, and removing himself from the Mormon Stories podcast group. And after he did that, uh, somebody posted and said, you know, we really need to step back and look at what happened here. Because as post-Mormons, we bill ourselves as having an open mind and being able to talk about things. But here we've got somebody who admittedly has a different perspective from us, but our culture of our group has become so closed to certain perspectives that there was no room for somebody with that particular point of view to feel safe, to feel like they were they had a home there. Um, that I, I was people feel dismissed a lot. I think people when 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 I come to you, Jonathan, and I say, let's talk about this issue. And it, it could be my marriage, mm -hmm. it could be my relationship with my dad, uh, it could be uh, having a conversation with my employer. When I sit down and have a conversation and say, like, hey, here's this problem, what are your thoughts? Here's my thoughts. Everybody wants to feel like their position is honored. And I think often in because Mormonism is so damn messy that in when when apologists, whether they are more nuanced and making more space for kind of accountability or whether it's the old guard, there's this feeling of being dismissed when you're on this side of things. Whenever you bring up a difficult issue and you point to the data and you say, like, the critic has a better answer, it doesn't matter whether you're talking to your bishop in an office, whether you're writing a message to Fair Mormon, whether you are having a conversation with, you know, one of the new guard, new age apologists, you always feel like you're being dismissed 
and that there's some level of like, hey, my protecting the church trumps me telling you what I actually think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like the way that I see it, and because I get riled up too. Like I listen to Brian Hales, I listen to in some cases to Jackson. I, I've met and talked with Jackson, and I I like it. I, I have some envy about yeah. the depth that he takes some of these things at the age that he's at. That's part of why I hate him too, because young whippersnappers who are uppity also get my goat. But um, the, one of the things that maybe people on that type of perspective don't ha understand is that there's a point at which nuance crosses over into gaslighting and that threshold is hard to to know but for people who were raised in a very literal concrete church which is the church that you and i know and that is you know when joseph smith came out with with the gospel words meant something truth meant something legitimate authority meant something and it's a very concrete way in which the gospel was formed. And so, you and I grew up knowing certain things that were absolutely true because they are the things that informed us about the legitimacy of Joseph Smith's claim. So, translating the Book of Mormon, translating the papyri into the Book of Abraham, all of these things meant something and they, they were part of the ingredients of the recipe that allowed us to surrender some of our agency, some of our worldview to the narrative of the church. And so, the, one of the things that I think particularly is hurtful to me and causes me to respond in the way that, that some of these nuanced apologists are seeing when they try to enter the post-Mormon space is that you're suddenly telling me that words don't have concrete meanings in the way that I always accepted them to be. And I heard Taylor Petri, uh, who is the new editor of Dialogue, give a talk at last year's Sunstone where he talked about the phenomenon of postmodernism uh, being employed where you're deconstructing the very concepts and terms that we have taken for granted and reformulating them in new ways to understand the world around us. And the problem with that in Mormonism is that you're taking apart and totally redefining some of the foundational framework that went into the worldview. And so, when the church comes out and says that translate doesn't mean translate, and, when in, and we're seeing now that people are saying, well, skin and color don't mean skin and color in the Book of Mormon, then it is um, really it's kind of messing with your worldview and you feel like you've been deceived or uh, like people are holding you to a different standard than you've been held to before. If they tell you, well, you're offended because you have some broken, outdated notion of the word translate, and this is what it's been all along. Like, can you imagine a way that people would, that are nuanced could engage with post-Mormons in a way that doesn't trigger that defensive response that causes some of this conflict? Yeah, when I was on the inside, when I was a member of the church and still going and still trying to hold a faithful position, I would go around and do firesides and presentations. Uh, and I specifically remember the one that led to me moving to Southern Utah, which was in Henderson, Nevada. And from 7 p.m. until 10 p.m., there were in the backyard of a good friend of mine. It wasn't my friend at the time. I didn't know him. He just brought me out there and had me do this presentation. About, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 people showed up. They're sitting in chairs in his backyard. And I've got a microphone in my hand. And I said, guys, ask me anything. Ask me whatever you want to ask me. And as people proceeded to ask about various issues in Mormonism, the Book of Abraham, seer stones, treasure digging, polygamy, all of it, um, what I would do is look them in the eye and say, you're right, this is really messy. Here's the critic's argument. Here's the faithful argument. Uh, in many of these issues, the critic's, uh, the critic's argument has more weight. Uh, at the same time, I'll, I'll tell you what the faithful position is or how to nuance it. If, if you're looking for a space to kind of hang on to. And uh, every single person in that crowd came up to me afterward, shook my hand and said, I've never had anybody talk to me that way where you, you allowed the church through your own words to be accountable for the messiness and for the things that don't add up. And yet you still also offered me hope that I could go to church this Sunday and try to make this thing a better place and try to hold on to some level of belief. And so, I think the key is to be honest, forthright, 
transparent to tell people what you're actually thinking inside your head rather than thinking something and going like, oh, if I say that, it hurts the church. So let me articulate it differently. Um, I, I think when you start being real honest with people and just saying like, look, yeah, you're right. The critic has a way a stronger position on the book of Abraham. Uh, but the church, you know, here's here's the argument the other way. I think people walk away not feeling gas uh, lighted, not feeling abused, not feeling traumatized further. Yeah. I think the the whole concept of validating your interlocutor's perspective or validating the person who you're talking to's perspective, even if you're coming at it from a very different position, has a way of softening those types of conversations. And so, when I think about what is the type of validation that somebody like Jackson or somebody like um, Patrick Mason or Marvin Perkins, who I had the opportunity to um, to interview earlier this week, what is the type of validation that I would want from people like that? And, and a lot of it is I want to acknowledge that the church said, taught, and imposed one framework in the past. And I'm going to present a different way to interpret these things or to perceive these things. And I understand that it means that my concept of this faith and of this religion is different from the one that you previously held and understood. And what this means is that I'm going to represent to you a perspective of the faith that may actually even be different from the one that the church holds itself, but it's one that is meaningful to me, and I'm going to share with you why it's meaningful to me. And so, if I say that the book of Abraham, translate doesn't mean translate, I'm telling you that I'm, I'm giving you my perspective in a way that's helped me to hold on to the things that I like in the church, understanding that the church's claims about legitimate translation and everything else in the past, you can't really defend it anymore. And so, we're going to let go of that. And the root of, of all of that is you have to kind of let go of the idea that the church has the one true way and that the prophets have God's truth and things like that, but that's harder to do. Now, Jackson Washburn has actually been participating in these comments, and he said that I can go ahead and send him a link and he will join. So, let me do that. He said that he'll be able to do audio only, that's fine. He's probably in his PJs. Okay, so we've got some, let's see, uh, regarding what went on, we've got somebody who say who says that it was his arrogance and that was what was turning people off. And I think this is part of the thing where, you know, each of us perceive how people interact with us and may perceive it as arrogance when it wasn't intended as arrogance or, or maybe they don't understand that it's arrogance. I don't know. Um, that's one of the things that is hard with... Uh, Jackson says he's coming on in a few minutes to set up. I think it's hard, particularly when Mormons talk to ex-Mormons, because uh, as ex-Mormons, to some extent, we say things with a lot of certainty. Um, I've done this myself in the past year. If you watch the happiness letter, I lay out an argument that Joseph Smith is a sexual predator, and I try to do it by identifying how you can identify a sexual predator in other religious figures, and then I show you things that Joseph Smith wrote and show how those parallels are. And so, then I am able to say, and I believe I've made the case that I can say Joseph Smith was a sexual predator, and I say it as a definitive declarative statement. And there are people who went to that presentation, people who I cherish my relationship with and I, I value, and they bring a lot of gravitas to the study of Mormon history, who felt like I was too harsh and too definitive in the way that I laid that case out. And I imagine that they would probably see somebody like myself making that presentation and saying that I was being arrogant because I was doing it. I was passing judgment on Joseph uh, from a position where I didn't, you know, maybe didn't have all the facts and so that I was doing. So, how do we get through our initial reaction to the way that we perceive people and treat them more as humans is kind of the challenge that we all have. I think, so I think there's a, a phenomenon going on here, which is whenever the evidence is not absolute perfect like it, it's so, like so absolutely demonstrable that something is the case when you need a certain position to hold out you only go as far as you have to go 
And what I've tried to do on this side of life, Jonathan, is I try to do things a little differently. I look at positions in the strength of them. And if one position far outweighs the strength of the other, and the other position requires a ton of conjecture, then I feel safe in going, look, the most reasonable, most logical, the most, uh, uh, what I think is the most obvious position is this one, and here's why. And, and I, I think the church does a beautiful job of playing both sides of the coin, which is uh, when it benefits the church, they are more than happy to take any little inkling and say, look, look, there's the evidence. It shows that, you know, Joseph was a good guy in this situation. But when it's not completely demonstrable, they say, whoa, 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 you don't know, you weren't there, maybe, maybe it happened differently. And I don't think you can play it both ways. I think all of us as humans in the rest of our life, we pick the conclusion that is the most reasonable and logical and requires the least amount of conjecture in all of phases of our life, except for religion, politics, and sports. <laughs> the things that are clearest and most dear to our hearts. Yeah, the things that are most tribal, the things that uh, we have allegiances to, we are willing to go with the weaker argument uh, more times than not. Well, it's interesting. I have a conversation scheduled for this Sunday at uh, noon central time with, of all people, Paul Toscano. And it's this very subject that we're actually going to be talking about, which is kind of the, the problems with making judgments of Joseph's character based on evidence that we have in the present and projecting that back and making conclusions about things that happened in the past. And this started on a conversation where he was talking about Paul H. Dunn and made some positive statements about Joseph Smith, and it kind of got me thinking, well, you know, he's clearly holding Joseph Smith in a particular, you know, space. I want to kind of see how he takes the evidence that I laid out on the issue of, of um, the sexual predator question, and that kind of led down the, the road to a series of questions dealing with you know, how confident are we of some of these data points and what conclusions can we actually make? And I'm I'm eager to see what his position is because Paul Toscano is kind of a, a different sort of character in how he's interacted. You know, he was one of the September 6th and he's written a lot about the mystic and spiritual nature of Mormonism and his own views on uh, the church, which are different from what the church currently holds, but are very provocative. So we'll see what his perspective is on Sunday. Cool. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. Um, when I lived in Ohio, and I was really aware of kind of what was going on in my ward, I didn't know anything about the September six until some years later. Maybe just briefly a, a brief mention of them. But you really kind of are isolated away from Utah Mormonism, and you don't really know what's going on. And so, it, during my journey here of 20 years in this thing, to watch uh, journeys of people like uh, the Toscanos um, and others who have been a voice for kind of shining a light on this messiness and trying to help us have more honest and vulnerable conversations about it. Uh, some of these people have suffered a lot, I, I, and I don't want to take up a ton of time, but I met a guy uh, was in his 70s, 80s, and he deconstructed Mormonism back in the 1950s. And to have done that without the internet, uh, I can only ama imagine the shame and uh, trauma that he was exposed to when he says, look, I just, I've read a lot. I know this thing is not what it claims to be. And, and yet everyone around him goes, that guy's crazy. Hmm. Now, he did it in the 1950s? Yeah. That's yeah. before the Tanners. I know. This guy was like 20 years old and he figures it out. Um essentially early on and uh, he talks about going to uh sunstone when it first kind of was just starting and showing up there and feeling like that was the only place he could be himself well well i think a lot of us can relate to the feeling of isolation that happens when you go on this journey and that's where we kind of have a new world for people growing up now and it may be that the reason that there's such uh, you know and relatively high number of young people who aren't afraid to step away from the faith and the tradition is because of the communities that have started to build up there. Um, that's one of the things that 
I'm I'm not, I'm out in the mission field in in Texas, and so we don't have as strong or as robust of an ex Mormon community there. But we try to do what we can. But people want it. I regularly, every few weeks or so, get messages from people wanting to find out if there's meetups or if there's you know things that they can do to to have that community. Cool. All right, I think we got Jackson. Let's add him to the stream. Jackson, Hello? can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can hear you. How are you doing? Good. Glad to be here. You'll have to. Thanks uh, for. Yeah, you'll have ahead. to forgive me. My voice is a little shot this morning, coming down with a oh. bit of a cold, but uh, I'm still happy to talk. All right. Well, hopefully it's not the coronavirus. Right. But well, I am at ASU, so that has been going around. Ooh. All right. You you, you got to chill, dude. So, Jackson, uh, you probably didn't catch the first part of our conversation, but one of the things that uh, I'm going to do every Friday is kind of just summarize the goings-on and melodrama in the ex-Mormon community because there's a crap ton of melodrama and nobody ever talks about it because, like Mormons, <laughs> ex-Mormons want to put up a happy face like everything. Oh, you leave the church and everything is all pretty and clean. But it's not. You know, sometimes there's, you know, people have conflicts. And you were at the center of a melodrama this week. And I just kind of wanted to see how things went from your perspective. I had a chance to send you a message earlier and uh, tell us kind of what, what you feel like happened and how you felt you were traded. Yeah, well, I suppose I took for, for granted uh, how, uh, how much of a melodrama it was. Um, I may know, be blowing this out of proportion, but yeah. it's something to talk about. So <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, it hasn't been the first time that uh, in that particular Facebook group, you know, I, there's been some, uh, some friction between myself and, and some of the um, commentators there. Um, but, uh, yeah, essentially, um, I, I think, you know, there's just, um, there's a lot of passions on both sides. Right. And, um, I don't know. It, I think it was in my best interest to step away for a little bit, uh, which is what I did. Uh, I do have plans to return. Um, so it wasn't a, like a permanent thing by any means. Um, but, uh, just given that you know, some of the conversations got a little heated and a bit too personal for me, um, yeah, I decided to just step away temporarily. Now, when you say, uh, too personal, were there people that were, uh, hurling insults at you and kind of re resorting to ad hominem in the discussion? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Um, and, and for, uh, most of my recent posts, um, and, and the ways that I was trying to interact with people, um, while it, it wasn't a purely, um, let's say, uh, uh, David Osler, you know, bridges type approach, right. It was more oh, of a, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say like, a uh, an intellectual conversation, um, where, you know, the, the emphasis isn't necessarily on, on one party seeking to, uh, just, you know, purely hear out and, and validate the other, but to exchange ideas bet between both. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 so, tried, I tried to go out of my way to not make them too apologetic, at least in terms of the, the content of the posts. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I think given the subject matter and given um, maybe a, a reputation that I've established for myself in the group, um, you know, things quickly kind of spiraled out of hand. Do you know about the post that was made after you left where people were really kind of having a moment of introspection saying, wait a second, what just happened? Did we chase somebody away with um, how we responded to a different perspective? Yeah, I've, I've been told about it. I haven't uh, seen it myself, so I'll be interested in doing so once I return. What is your perception of why people respond so negatively to how uh, you engage in these conversations? Um, I think I think for most people, it's safe to say that it's just a natural part of the deconstruction process. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's totally valid to experience things such as uh, anger or resentment or bitterness, or um, it can be very difficult, at least in my experience, uh, for uh, people in different spaces to, um, uh, you know, perhaps like compartmentalize or, you know, just kind of uh, uh, depersonalize, you know, the issues that we talk about um, because there's so much 
baggage and personal baggage that's attached to them. Like, I, I feel like I'm able to discuss my religious faith um, in a pretty non-personal way. Like, I'm fine, you know, kind of just placing things to the side and saying, like, let's have an open conversation about it. Um, but for some other people, I perceive that, uh, you know, there's... It, there's just a lot of, uh, of emotions, you know, very real and valid emotions attached to those things. And so that can be difficult to do, um, to, you know, kind of detach yourself, uh, you know, in the, uh, process of, uh, talking about them. So, you know, um, I, I get that. And, uh, you know, maybe in terms of personality, not everyone, uh, gets along with my, with my style online. Um, you know, I, I did listen, uh, I did catch the part where you, um, just on this, uh, um, conversation here that you're streaming, mm -hmm. uh, talked about ways that, you know, perhaps I could have, uh, uh, you know, precursored, uh, or, or garnished my, uh, thoughts before I shared them, you know, saying like, um, you know, I, I understand that this is like not, you know, what you might've been taught or the views that, you know, you might hold to be orthodox mormonism uh it might not be shared by the church today etc cetera, etc cetera. um yeah. you know nonetheless here's how i kind of reconcile and process them um and i agree you know I, I think that that would be more uh constructive for sure um i'm not always um i guess uh i haven't always chosen to take the time to do that right um and and so you're I, not alone you're right not right you know, every and, single one of the apologists that comes and defends a church that exists in their mind, which is totally different from the church that exists in reality that we kind of grew up with and we're still struggling with, uh, never takes the time to say, wait a second, my conception of faith and religion in this church is totally different than the church's own conception. They, they never do that. They're just defending the, this ethereal thing that is the church. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then the other thing too, you know, social media can be uh, a really ineffective means of communicating with other people. Um, and, and certainly in the group too, uh, for various people that are in different phases of deconstruction, right. Um, you know, very, very few, uh, take the time as well to, you know, kind of say, here's where I'm at, you know, here's how it might relate or, you know, be different than, you know, those in the group or those around me. Right. It, it it's just the process of, you know, like it, it takes a long time to type all that out. Um, and do so yeah. consistently. Um, and so that's why I do enjoy conversations like this, where we're able to have more uh, time to, you know, uh, fully communicate, you know, what we might yeah. be thinking and feeling. I think that's far more effective. Um, I think some of it is um, maybe a deficiency on the part of everybody that takes part in these communities, in that when you join any of these Facebook communities, there's a little thing that says, okay, this is the purpose and intent of this community. And so, if you look at the Mormon Stories podcast, it is something that's supposed to be open to multiple perspectives, but a lot of people that go and they find a home there, they see it as a support group. Right. And sure. there's something very different from a support group where you have a lot of people who have the shared esprit de corps of shared trauma and the nature of that trauma. You know, if you were talking about a support group for people, uh, you know, who were like Vietnam War vets, and then somebody came in and said, all that trauma that you experienced isn't that big of a deal, right, I right, went right. through it and I have no problem with, you know, that suddenly introduces a new type of trauma into the recovery process that a support group is meant for. Right. And I think that we may have actually re invented the concept of that particular forum to be a support group when it's not. And that's where people can kind of step back and say, wait a second, what is the intention of this particular group? Is there a different place that I can make sure that I'm prepared to have this type of conversation? Yeah. yeah. And and I've expressed that to the to the admins and, and various people involved with the group too. And I, I think other people have uh, kind of noticed that um, dissonance between the, the stated description of what the group is and what it's been for years. Uh, versus, you know, what purpose it serves and uh, how it functions. Um, so I, I totally uh, agree that those are, you know, uh, at least on the ground in the group, uh, two different things um, often. Do you see that, um, I think for me is, you know, I'm in my fourth decade of life now, and I see somebody like yourself coming in and making these statements, and... Um, saying them with a great deal of passion and confidence in your perspective, and I can credit you for that. But at the same time, I feel like the um, 
there, there, there's some things, and this is kind of the whole OK Boomer phenomenon that you know everybody's having right now. Where <laughs> we want to we want to put you in your place and say you haven't lived enough to really understand these things. Like you right. haven't lived through four decades of your life hating yourself for your very humanity because you feel perpetually inadequate to living up to impossible standards, uh -huh. and you've had your secret shell of shame that you've lived with your entire life. That you, when you go through your rediscovery process, you realize is you know just normal part of being human and since you haven't experienced that you haven't given your life your identity your sense of well-being to this organization that abused you in such terrible ways and so how can you come into this space and start making excuses that defy the very logic and rationality which allowed us to free ourselves from that prison and so that's for me i think that's where um your the the harm that not just yourself but other people who are coming up with these new ways to look at the faith you know that's like the re-trauma that i experience is, mm -hmm. is just the whole um feeling like the pain and suffering that i went through was nothing and that people just have you know their own way to to deal with things in a way that to me it's it's kind of hurtful i don't know how you what do you respond when boomers come to you with that yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll say, you know, it is, it is fairly common. Um, and uh, at, at times the tone is perhaps a, a bit more, you know, condescending or patronizing than, than I would appreciate. Um, but I do understand um, the difference. And, and one reason it doesn't always resonate with me um, is because uh, for a long time, you know, I've been told that it's only a matter of, you know, you, you, you have two years left until, you know, you, you already have one foot out the door you're going to leave, you know, two years from now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and people, um, not just, uh, you know, from a more critical side, but also from the apologist side, um, uh, you know, personally, because I take part in diverse communities, a lot of people want to claim me as their own or like to project where I'm going to be years from now, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, I don't know, uh, like a, like a more nuanced intellectual Mormon or, you know, a future ex-Mormon or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so I've gotten that for a while and none of them, uh, have really resonated with me personally because, um, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I want to be realistic, um, of course, um, and not set, uh, unrealistic expectations for myself. And so in the course of doing that, I don't want to definitively say, you know, I know where I'm going to be 10 years from now or 20 years from now, a, a lot can change and that can go various directions. Um, and I, I think it's totally valid for people to point out that their lived experience uh, is very different from the religion that I describe or the religion that I try to rationalize or uh, talk about. Um, and, uh, and the reason I agree with them is because it is, um, you know, the, the, the circumstances in which I was raised in were fairly unique. Uh, the circumstances of uh, my church experience, um, you know, I was in seminary and we're having lessons on the gospel topic essays. You know, I'm taking an institute class right now on the gospel topics essays uh, that's really in-depth. Um, you know, I have the privilege of experiencing a lot of things uh, that, you know, uh, those older than me, if they had experienced probably would have resolved or, you know, um, helped out with a lot of the, the faith troubles that, you know, they've gone through. Right. Um, I, I've known about seer stones since I was 11 or 12, you know? Um, and so I don't have the same experience of growing up and feeling like, uh, my, my church, uh, you know, taught me that these were all anti Mormon lies because I've grown up in the age of the Joseph Smith papers and the gospel topics essays. And, you know, certainly not, I, I don't think the church is in a perfect position as far as transparency goes. And as far as it's uh, historical work goes. Um, but I think we've made, you know, tremendous progress compared to where we've been. Um, and because of that, that makes me very optimistic of where we can go. And, uh, you know, I can recognize that even though the church has not always been forthright with its history and, um, has not always approached it um, uh, in a in a very transparent or robust way. Um, that at least now you know uh, there's space for us to do that, um, and the church makes act active efforts to do that. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it does come down to I've experienced different things. Um, and I want to grant validity to the people that uh, lived Mormonism in a time uh, that it was not like my own upbringing, um, you know, because the circumstances were certainly different. Uh, but I think there's validity in my own experience too, right? And that raises questions of, um, you know, generationally at least, um, should there be an expectation that uh, the things that uh, cause crises of faith or that cause one to raise serious objections to the church, should those remain the same? Um, because I could say at least, um, you know, for millennials, uh, a lot of them uh, likely will not, uh, or, or I shouldn't say millennials, like Gen Z, um, many of them likely will not, you know, grow up saying, you know, I was taught that seer stones were anti-Mormon lies, right? And once I found that out, it, you know, broke the shelf and, you know, it made me realize how many other things the church had lied about because that just doesn't reflect their immediate experience growing up in the church, right? So these things develop and they change and generationally they're not always going to be static and uh, so, consistent and relatable for everyone. I want to um, bounce something off of you. Things like the historical issues in the church are fascinating and to many people it feeds into the notion that they've been lied to. The thing that always comes to my mind about this is because of all these historical things, those fed into a narrative that imposed itself on my life, on my worldview, on my self-conception, and for a significant part of my life affected the choices that I made, the directions mm -hmm. that I went, and I, I mixed and allowed those things to shape my identity. I surrendered an aspect of my existence to what I now understand are lies. And so, for me, if I was to go back into time and say, what aspects of my existence and my identity have I given to the church? And you would include things like, uh, you know, how you approached uh, marriage, how you approached your career choice, how you approached the choices that you made on the cusp of adulthood and in adolescence, and all of those things that carry heavy repercussions out into adulthood. So, for you, I assume that you've thought about this uh, and that you understand it. Would you say that you've considered at least that aspect of the faith journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, and are you talking about more specifically with the people that I interact with or just… Uh, no, just in like, general. Oh. So, if I were to ask you, can you describe to me some of the things that you claim for yourself, that you allow yourself to have and do and be a part of your life, that you understand older people had deprived themselves of or closed themselves to and that because of the church and that um that you recognize the difference um well i mean you know uh on the one hand the the literature and the things that i expose myself to and, and read um you know i'm very comfortable and i have been from my early teenage years reading from a variety of perspectives uh including critical ones and so you know, I don't have the same, uh, you know, perhaps black and white, you know, it's either faithful or it's anti-Mormon mentality, um, and anything anti-Mormon is to be shunned. I've always, you know, been pretty open to considering other perspectives, and I've never personally received any, any counsel, um, or, you know, at least not any counsel that I took seriously, saying, you need to stop reading these things, you, you know, you're going to lose your testimony etc etc um that just hasn't been my lived experience um let's see i'm, I'm trying to think of uh, perhaps some, oh well i mean uh, so the the most obvious easy one is uh you know do you drink coffee do you allow yourself to drink coffee without any guilt or second thought and by extension do you not color your view of other people who do drink coffee um, I don't personally drink coffee, and that's a personal choice that I don't uh, consider. Um, well, uh, let me put it this way. I was raised a Latter-day Saint, right? And so naturally, I've grown up not drinking coffee. Um, and the space that I'm at in my faith right now is one in which if I felt one day that I wanted to drink coffee, um, you know, I, I feel like I would be fine doing that and not feel significant guilt over it. Um, I don't drink coffee, and it's because um, 
you know, in large part, I don't like the taste and I don't like the smell. And so, um, you know, it's just a, it's just a matter of, you know, personal, not, not liking it. Right. Um, so but one the, of the things, one of the dynamics that was part of my own personal journey was, um, imagining what it would be like to wake up one day and realize that you were in the KKK uh -huh. and realize that your conceptions of the world were racist and bigoted not because of any conclusions that you came to on your own but because of a paradigm a false paradigm of truth that had been imposed on you your whole life that was the very air that you breathed and so part of the existence and the identity that you surrendered to this organization turned you into a racist bigot and you had no idea because you didn't know any other way you just thought that's the reality and that's what it was and it doesn't only include conceptions of race and gender and lgbtq issues it includes just how i viewed for example my uncles and my cousins who drank michelob or coors after a hard day of work who smoked or who drank coffee and tea i saw them as less than because they had these trappings of that because the the whole worldview of what was righteous and what was not righteous, how we were special because we kept these different things, it shaped and colored how I saw even people that I loved that were close to me, and I didn't realize it until the end. And so when I talk about things that you may not have experienced, some of it are things that you, it's hard to know unless you have been in a position in your life where you've felt and othered other people based on false ideas that were handed to you and so when you finally wake up to those false ideas you feel a great deal of resentment towards the people who falsified those ideas and and took that identity and, and imposed their identity on you if you see what i mean yeah um and i can relate to that to an extent um in the sense that during the my process of figuring out my own faith journey if i was going to continue identifying as a mormon um if i was going to perhaps join another religious faith um, there was years of, uh, you know, I, I would consider deconstruction or uh, research during my teenage experience uh, where I fought very hard to try to maintain a very orthodox Mormon worldview, the one that was normalized in the institution around me, in my community, and the one that I had largely encountered, uh, you know, as a, as a part of my own upbringing, even though there were unique aspects to my upbringing um, still, you know, I, I heard, you know, uh, almost completely the same messages that, you know, other Latter-day Saints around the globe uh, heard when I would attend church, right? Yeah. So, um, I did experience a process of deconstruction of of uh, analyzing those beliefs, and, and there were certainly times in my life where, you know, I might look with disdain upon someone that's, you know, drinking coffee or drinking alcohol or, um, you know, choosing to have premarital sex or something like that, right? Um, I, I personally, you know, now, I don't experience that same kind of disdain. Um, a lot of uh, my experience has been rooted in both, like, interfaith activism, so participating in communities of other religions, um, but then, you know, not just restricted to religion, interacting with people of secular worldviews, uh, where I've been able to make, you know, many relationships, great relationships with people across the uh, ideological spectrum, right? And I'm able to see that, you know, just because they engage in, in this or that behavior doesn't inherently make them, you know, an immoral person or a sinner or something like that, right? Um, I feel at liberty to make my own choices, some of which, you know, may or may not uh, uh, be the same as those around me. Um, but I certainly don't uh, um, uh, carry those same feelings towards uh, people that choose differently anymore. Um, and especially where religion is concerned, um, when I was 12, my mom converted to evangelical Christianity. Um, and so very early on in the formulation of my Mormon worldview, I had to develop a, like an epistemology and a system which allowed for my mom to continue to be a good, sincere you know, awesome human being, right, that God didn't hate and God wasn't going to send to outer darkness uh, because she chose to leave the church. Um, you know, she she uh, took her name off the list. Um, and, you know, I had to seriously ask myself, do I believe that I'm going to be with my mom, you know, in eternity or not, right? 
Um, and so from the very belief that, you know, promise that families can be together forever, the other side of the coin was, oh my gosh, you know, am I not going to be with my mom now? Or what about these other people um, in my life who might have chosen to leave the church? And so um, I had to develop a, a worldview pretty quickly um, in which, you know, my belief in God continued, um, but I didn't believe, you know, in eternal separation or things like that. Um, and the thing is, you know, when people, um, uh, perhaps in the Mormon stories group or, you know, that uh, are in different phases of deconstruction or their experiences in the church are different from mine, you know, they might look at these beliefs and say, um, you know, these are just completely foreign to, to the Mormonism I experienced. These are unorthodox. Um, you know, for me, I, I feel like it was because of my historical research in Mormonism, finding different general authorities uh, who have expressed different views, you know, reading uh, different texts in Mormon scripture, you know, going over the, the theology, the history, and, and how it developed. Um, I felt um, more flexibility in kind of establishing my own Mormon worldview that in many of my views, um, I'd say, are rooted in some kind of Mormon text or tradition or practice or um, uh, like historical event or something like that, right? Like I can tie it within the Mormon movement, um, even if it doesn't reflect uh, contemporary orthodoxy, right? And so for me, I still I, I feel like it's uh, authentically Mormon because it's within the tradition, um, even if it doesn't uh, necessarily always reflect the uh, contemporary institutional views. Okay. See, I think that perspective, and that's why one of the reasons I was really helpful and glad that you were willing to come on is that when we get to those points where the tensions are so high and the, the right. na name calling comes, it, it, we're already at a point at that point where we're, we're responding emotionally and we've kind of dehumanized the other person in our mind. Right. And so, I, when I'm, I've had this happen, you know, several times in um, Facebook. And whenever I realize, wait a sec, I might have at a point where I'm just arguing for the sake of argument, what I usually do is I click on their profile and I scroll through and I try to see pictures of them yeah. with their yeah. family, Even with their I kids, yeah. doing things, and really realize, you know, these are dynamic, complex people who, who come to their positions because of meaningful things. And when you tell me that part of the start of your journey in deconstructing and reconstructing your faith was because suddenly somebody that was close to you and that you loved was in a position that was outside of the space that was considered safe in your present view, you had to recreate it for that. I feel like that is a journey a lot of people have had to go on. Um, you know, there's the saying of, you know, be careful who you hate because it may turn out to be somebody that you love. Uh -huh. And people who have come to terms with a uh, gay son or daughter or other things that they've suddenly realized that the dogma that they've accepted places them in a category of other have to recreate and reformulate that dogma. Um, I think part of the, the, the difficulty that you will have in spaces like the Mormon Stories group and other groups is that um, it, you really, you know, the, it's, it's a metaphor that is, is somewhat fraught but has a lot of similarities when you talk about somebody who is a battered spouse and then has worked through that trauma, has finally built up enough um, of a ability to, to, to draw a boundary that they've been able to separate themselves from that battered spouse because it's not just the battering, it's also the messaging of you're not good enough, you'll never make it on your own, you need me, I love you, everything I'm doing for you is love. You know, those, those type of messages go into a battered spouse situation. And so, being able to get yourself out of that situation um, is something that is difficult to do. So, when you have a space where people who have gotten to that point, and then suddenly somebody comes in and says, well, they weren't really beating you. You know, you just thought it was beating you. You were beating yourself up. They're okay. You know, look, it's fine. You know, I've had no problem for that particular spouse. It it just is such a tumultuous thing for somebody to have to process while they're in the process of rebuilding themselves. And that's kind of the trauma I feel like we're, we're it, it's, you know, it's not a perfect metaphor, but they're, as you said, there are phases that people go through in this process, and maybe the Mormon Stories group is so broad in its scope that it includes people at that, what we'll say is kind of a delicate point of phase, that it's harder for them to see 
people coming in and reframing the church in the way that you do sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. Okay. Well, I'm hopeful that uh, at some point you'll be able to re-engage. I think it's it's useful if anyone in the Mormon Stories podcast group who had a lot of difficulty um, sees this, maybe we can reimagine what, you know, what the proper role of that group is. Um, I found that early on I was much more sensitive to things like that, and now I think particularly it was a part of the CES letter where Jeremy Reynolds says, you know, you'll listen to statements by Brian Hales, by Richard Bushman, and they'll defend the church and defend Joseph, but they never go into the fact that their whole conception of faith and religion and the church is very different from what the church itself has. And because you don't know about that difference, you accept their statements as though they're defending the church as it exists. And it, you have to actually get in and talk with them in order to understand those fundamental differences, and that really helps soften and kind of helps you reframe what they're saying so you can understand it better. I had that experience recently with Marvin Perkins. If you had a chance to catch that um, interview, before that interview, every time I heard Marvin Perkins talk about race and the Book of Mormon, it really gave me uh, a cloud of dissonance because I couldn't understand how he could say and do the things that he was saying right. because it was so different from what the church has. But when you talk to him and you understand that his whole conception of religion, spirituality, and man's connection with God it takes the center role of anything else that he does. And so, it doesn't matter what prophet, he, and he said multiple times, I don't follow the prophet, and if there's anything that creates divisions um, between men and God, then I see that as false because it betrays my conception of what the one great commandment is. Right. And so, once I saw that view, then now I can look at all of his articles and everything that he says, and I say, you know, this is somebody who knows the issues within Mormonism, who knows that if you're going to acknowledge that all faiths fall short of being perfect and being the one true thing, then there are things in Mormonism that you can latch onto and find a, a foothold on, but you're going to have to throw away some things and you're going to have to reframe other things. And if they were okay teaching false things for a hundred years, then we can redefine terms and we can see terms in a different way that allows us to connect with God if that works for us. And so, that's why I'm glad you were able to come and talk about it. And if nobody got a chance to check out the Marvin Perkins interview, it's it's very um, insightful. Yeah, I, I have a few uh, comments I'd like to make too, sure. um, just, just from some previous things that I heard you and Bill talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them um, uh, was regarding um, just uh, interactions that I have with uh, with people in the Mormon Stories group um, who right they're going through different. Uh, phases of deconstruction. Uh, they hold different worldviews than I do. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if this will be any consolation to them if they hear this. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I certainly do have uh, um, uh, a similar... Let's see, how do I phrase this? Um, we all have our styles of writing online, right? Um, and so, I... I'm actually part of, uh, you know, more groups than just the Mormon Stories group. Many of them, you know, comprised of, of Orthodox Latter-day Saints. Um, and I get into uh, perhaps inverse uh, conversations with them <laughs> where, right, you know, I'm kind of pissing you're them taking off. off. You're taking off all the conventional Mormons. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, for me, sometimes I joke and I say, like, if I haven't been called a blind apologist and a, you know, um, a, an anti-Mormon in the same day, you know, then maybe I'm doing something wrong, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, See, I, I'm actually jealous of you in that regard because <laughs> I'm at a point where I only have access to, um, uh, post-Mormon spaces. Like yeah. there's very few faithful spaces that can probably handle me or you know like i would have to be very very restrained there's a few that i'm in mostly the the prepper groups just because i want to see the crazy oh, and, yeah. so i just i lay low on that i just want to see it yeah, yeah. but um you know i would love it if because like w when i'll release something i would love to see how um you know the people behind saints unscripted respond to it or something like that there was like the the I did a response to the three Mormons back in the day on the right. issue of race, and I would love to see how they were, how they processed that. And they probably didn't even watch it, but it's kind of oh, one no, of those things did. where you, 
where you want to see how they respond to these things. And so you have access to those spaces and and um, that that is a side of you that maybe we lose sight of is that you you're you're in both areas, so you get to well, uh, yeah. And I'm not I'm not just in both areas, but I'm you know uh, putting these same ideas out in both areas, right? And so where in Mormon stories uh, in that group they might tell me your ideas don't reflect that of the church, you know they're not orthodox, you know you'd be better off leaving. Well, that's typically the same message that I'm getting from uh, some of the orthodox <laughs> Latter Day Saints that I'm talking with, right? Um, you know, who uh, similarly have uh, very specific conceptions of how a Mormon faith is supposed to operate. And, you know, if I say things that, that challenge that or don't resonate with their experience, uh, you know, then, you know, we get into uh, doctrinal disputes over it or, or things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i definitely in a unique place, um, but I certainly don't just limit my energies to people uh, who are deconstructing. Um, you know, it's I, I personally enjoy engaging across the spectrum um, because I'm able to see um, more of the diversity. Um, I get to encounter a lot of people in different spaces. Um, and people would ask me, like in the Mormon Stories group, like, why are, why are you even here? You know, what are your motives? What are you hoping to get out of this? And I would pretty consistently say, you know, I'm here for, you know, I'm trying to spark, like, good conversations with people that, you know, I may not see eye to eye with. Um, because I've been in the Mormon Stories group on and off for, for years now. Um, and uh, it's, it's where I've encountered uh, quite a few people that, you know, I feel like I've been able to have great conversations with. Um, yourself, Anthony Miller, others. Um, that's, you know, the, the space in which I, uh, initially encountered you guys. Right. And we were able to start communicating with each other. And so for me, you know, the group has been constructive, uh, to both, uh, you know, my own faith journey. Um, when I first entered it, uh, I was definitely going hard apologist. Like I remember, I think probably the first thing that I posted in there, um, I, I don't know if you ever saw it, uh, fair Mormon did like a video, um, is like a like a kind of dramatized video, like twenty minutes long, on like a faith crisis, and um, they have like actors and stuff. It's really cheesy. Um, but back in the day when uh, you know Fair Mormon was my bread and butter, and you know it was just answering all the questions I ever had, you know, just very satisfying ways, and I didn't know mm -hmm. anything different. Um, yeah, I I I had the. Uh, audacity or perhaps the naivete of uh, posting that in the group thinking that, yeah, oh my gosh, these people, they just need fair Mormon. If only they encountered this too. I'm sure they haven't, you know, and then oh, oh, you, it, you it was a quick learning child. curve, my friend. It was a very quick learning curve. Um, and it, it was good for me because I was able to understand, wow, like, you know, stepping into a, a group that uh, is like this, and being like just a flagrant apologist um, can be come off as very tone deaf. It can be you know dismissive or um, you know invalidating of other people's experiences. And so recently, I've tried my best in the posts that uh, that I've shared in the group to open them uh, open them up in such a way that they're accessible to people of varying perspectives, right? So I think I did a post in there on like uh, why. Um, let's see, uh, I, I did one post that was like a, like a literary approach to the Book of Mormon. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read Grant Hardy's Understanding the Book of Mormon through mm -hmm. Oxford University Press. It's really good because he doesn't put any uh, kind of uh, requirements on the reader to ascend to s certain like claims of faith. Um, it's purely literary. It's talking about the, the book's complexity, the internal you know narrative, arguments, things like that. And, you know, if we're approaching it in terms of literature, I think there's a lot that's, you know, fascinating about the text and, you know, it's worthy of study and, and there's many different insights that one can get out of it um, that aren't prerequisite on whether you accept it as an ancient text or a 19th century production, right? Um, I, so I imagine we're going to see a lot more of that perspective. Right. Uh, um, I'd love to cultivate conversations like that uh, with people across the spectrum who are ready to have them, right? Um, one thing I encountered when I kind of posted that or tried to prompt a conversation regarding that, um, it, you know, a lot of people 
in certain uh, phases of deconstruction um, because of their very intense feelings about the Book of Mormon, you know, and their feelings that, you know, they once, you know, believed and, you know, had certainty that it was historical, that it was, uh, you know, certain things. Now that it's not anymore, it, it symbolizes perhaps in ways, you know, the, the, the lie that they believe that they accepted their whole life, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of, you know, very intense feelings that are attached to it. And many people in the group, I think, uh, are of the uh, attitude that it's better off, you know, just not being uh, approached at all, right? Don't waste your time with it, Don't, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's a fraud, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there there's some friction raised over that. M- my point is, um, I've tried to be more... Um, uh, thoughtful in my posts. Um, I certainly haven't always garnished them with the, uh, precursor that, you know, you, you kind of, uh, um, gave an example of, uh, that I could perhaps do moving forward or, or that all of us could do and kind of, um, making, uh, I statements and, uh, validating other people's perspectives and trying to, identify where we fall on the ideological spectrum compared to institutions or other groups of people. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope to continue having conversations with the group so long, uh, as the, uh, admins, um, want to, <laughs> you know, continue well, to work, foster work, that kind of conversation. Right. Yeah. The work isn't all yours. A lot of it also is for us going through the deconstruction to, um, at some point you just realize like when you jump in and you're, you're in fair Mormon apologetic mode, we could just step back and just uh, like, at some point you realize that that is what you're doing and you're, you, you're still in that space where that's what you need to do and, and you can detach yourself from it. And mm-hmm. eventually we get there too. So it's, I think both of us are changing in terms of different right. sides. Yeah, no, I, I would just love to be able to be better understood in the group um, uh, in the sense that I'm often called, uh, you know, like an apologist or a TBM or stuff like that. And that's not how I self-identify. Um, you know, I think I do engage in apologetics occasionally, but, you know, I, I perhaps have a broader sense of what that means and what that looks like. And um, Oh, so that brings up a question, though. Yeah. As I heard you talking about that moment in your life where FAIR was providing the answers that resonated with you, what is your take on FAIR now? And what's your relationship with them in that regard? Like, is that still yeah, um, something that you affiliate with? Yeah, I, I have a lot of friends that are involved with FAIR, and honestly, I wouldn't be opposed to perhaps presenting with them down the road um, in the same sense that I'm not uncomfortable presenting at Sunstone. Um, you know, I, it's just what I do. I take part in these diverse venues. Um, and so I don't always share the same uh, conclusions that they might uh, reach on their website or they might offer. Um one thing that I kind of uh, don't um, find helpful uh, for myself nowadays um, is, uh, y- you know, like uh, they, they have it set up in kind of a, like a wiki style uh, with all the, all the questions or criticisms and the answers. Um, I don't, uh, I don't really agree with uh, the approach that, uh, um, that takes some of these questions or concerns and wants to give a soundbite answer to them, you know, as a kind of like end of conversation, like, there you go, you know, like problem solved. Right. Um, I value nowadays ongoing conversations with people of different perspectives, uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm open to more than just one answer on, on a subject. I'm, I'm open to, and and I'm not saying that the folks at fair Mormon, uh, Hold on, on just a second, Jackson. I'm going to yeah. see if this is a legitimate call. No worries. Hello, this is Talking Things and Stuff. All right, hold on just a second. Let me uh, get the phone tab working because they can't hear you right now. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. I'll get that there and hit share. All right, and we'll go back to this. Okay, you're on Talk on Things and Stuff. Do you have a question Hi. for us? It's great to actually hear you. I've been watching your stuff for quite some time. I really enjoy how you put your uh, your information together. Um, but just to give you a little information about me, return missionary, went to southern France, uh, came home and uh, decided to tell tell the folks, sorry, um, you sent me to a 2,000-year-old country. 
and I sort of learned how you put this stuff together, so I can't do this anymore. And mm-hmm. ever since, I sort of got that same treatment of, uh, please, please just don't come back. And um, so I decided to join the U.S. Air Force and became a cryptological linguist and then moved into network engineering. And uh, throughout this entire experience, I always took this idea with me of what is this thing called Mormonism? Why was it such a big, big thing in my life? You know, um, went through that same problem that a lot of people go through of who am I, you know, without this uh, yeah. gigantic experience that, you know, we grew up with. And um, one of the craziest things that, you know, I was ever able to do was to learn all these other languages, uh, such as Arabic and Hebrew, to, you know, of course, for the military um, concept and, and, and using that with uh, computers and uh, analysis. But what was, what was the most, it was sort of like a, a side effect was, hey, here's all these languages that sort of profess this almost same thing. And I see, you know, new, almost new religions rising up um, using this almost, I guess the best word is formula. Um, you know, and when I look back at, you know, Joseph Smith, which I, you know, I had a huge distaste for the church after I got out like most Mormons. Uh, but uh, now my biggest question is, is like, where, where, because, you know, just like everything else, uh, you know, there's going to be an evolution. And I'm wondering what it would be like, you know, if somebody got a hold of this, this type of formula and were to computerize it. And to sort of put it out there on a, um, like, hey, let's diagnose people psychologically and give them sort of a Scientology um, concept, but sort of analyze them through how they use the Internet or how they use their social media or how they use um, their ideas. I know it sounds a little bit... When you say a formula, are you talking about a a conception of the world in a metaphorical sense that gives them the answer to the spiritual questions that were posed with? What do you mean by formula? Sure, sure, and and um, you know, for for a long time, I'd have to I'd have to admit, just like most Mormons, when I got out, I became a devout atheist. <laughs> you know, I said, hey, nothing can be true, and it wasn't until I got out of the military about four years ago that I started having a new spiritual awakening. And when this all started happening, I started noticing what I like to call the formula, where it, it's not completely one hundred percent this rigid computer analysis thing, but it also is the, you know, it has to deal with mythological, those old stories that keep on popping up over and over, not just in um, our movies or um, our, you know, our stories, uh, but it's, it's, it's this idea of the, you know, that, that hero's journey that we see, you know, where you can take it to that mythological world where it's like, Hey, where are you? How hard are you pushing? You know, what is it that you want out of this life? Mm-hmm. And it can get, you know, sort of esoteric, you know, where you realize that a lot of people aren't asking these questions anymore. They're, they're sort of they're really satisfied. And I think, you know, things like Facebook or YouTube can get people into that satisfied moment where they lose their aspect of, hey, what is right around the next bend? What, what am I here to do? And always, you know, enjoying that, that question that we were, you know, posed as kids. And I think something like Mormonism has, has lost that. And for, so for like a certain situation like yours, where you're trying to open up these conversations where you run into the same wall that a lot of us run into as the ex-Mormons, where you get that sort of glazed over effect, where the person just sort of stares off into the distance and you can tell their programming inside sort of shut off. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, you know, you let, me, bring let me focus your comments to a question that we can um, talk to Jackson about. Um, so, Jackson, sure. on the question yeah. of would it be possible to take the framework of religion that we see replicated around the world? Because I think you would agree, Jackson, particularly now that you're studying, you're engaged in a, a in a graduate or undergraduate level of study of religion, that you're seeing that there are certain themes and kind of mechanics that religions tend to have in common. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and absolutely. I, I, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and oh, caller, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Jackson answer your question or or move on to the next phase of the conversation. So I'm gonna hang up now so we can kind of have that. Thank you very much for your comments. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Yeah, Jonathan. 
I'd say that um, I've definitely seen that, and um, because I was exposed to different religions pretty early on through my teenage years and, and actively took part in different communities, um, I think that was another part of uh, kind of my uh, you know, deconstruction or, or crisis of faith or whatever you want to call it, um, where you know I was having these uh, critiques of Mormonism um, exposed to me. Um, and some of them, you know, had to do with maybe social or cultural or historical concerns. Um, but then as I start learning about other religions, I'm able to see a lot of parallels in just the development of different religious traditions, um, other groups that have similar conversations. I love listening nowadays to podcasts, um, that, uh, um, I mean, uh, some ex-Mormons might call them uh, neo-apologist evangelicals, um, but you know, these uh, uh, I, I see similar things happening uh, from other high-demand uh, religious traditions, specifically within the the Abrahamic faiths, um, where um, individuals grow up and they realize there's a lot more complexity to uh, the religious beliefs that they were taught um, than. You know they otherwise, you know, believed or or um, were told, and that can be a painful process of deconstruction where they're asking questions about you know their uh, the particular morals they espouse, uh, the the way that they view other human beings, the way that they relate to the world uh, and understand God and understand their own religious history, and so I, I see a lot of parallels, um, you know, between people of those different religious groups that you know, also experience um, periods of uh, resentment or uh, bitterness or intense hurt or, uh, you know, indifference or things like that uh, towards the, the faiths that they were raised with, right? Um, and so The question somebody, that comes to my mind when, when I hear yeah. you talking about that is, are all religions valid? And if not, how do you tell the difference? between one that you would consider not to be valid and one to be considered valid, and what do we mean by valid? Mm -hmm. Because when I hear the caller say, you know, what if we could create, you know, we could take these frameworks of all these different religions and create a new religion, maybe, you know, using some sort of computer algorithm or something to help us assimilate all these themes, um, you know, the, the question comes to my mind of, um, you know, I is that the ethical thing to do? Mm -hmm. Because one of the common threads that I recognize going through all religions is that you, you know, I've said this before, and it's a recurrent theme, is that you shape your worldview and your self-conception based on perceived truths that the religion gives you based on its claim to truth. Mm -hmm. And so, as a Mormon, this includes your own concept of your spiritual identity, the premortal existence, why you're here on earth and what you have to go, and that informs the choices that you make. But if the foundation that informs those choices is false, then you are making decisions based on false information. And that's right. something that we would not consider to be healthy if we were talking about finances or investments or something like that. And so, there's a degree of, of unethical um, foundation to creating or fabricating a system of truth. And that's why when I look at religions, I could say there are some religions that have the validity in that they give you space to still be a, to have your free agency, to, to be able to make decisions that don't immediately ostracize you from the community within reasonable, ba reasonable bounds. You know, we're not, we're not saying that murder, theft, and rape, and things that are universal moral um, boundaries uh, don't exist. But, uh, it, you know, when you have systems that create proprietary boundaries based on truth claims that are falsifiable, that's where distortions start happening that, that create problems. How do you draw the line there? Yeah, um, I, you, perhaps another way to approach it, um, because I, I think there are certainly many people who do, um, you know, based off particular historical claims or truth claims, you know, uh, make uh, decisions and it informs their reality. Um, so I definitely, I definitely agree. I think another part of it uh, as well um, comes through um, uh, the mode of uh, like religious experience, right? Subjective, personal, religious experience. Um, I think those can very much serve as lenses as well. 
which people, you know, if we use the example of Mormonism, uh, you know, if you have certain experiences about the, the Book of Mormon or different things like that, uh, many Mormons use that as a means of verifying the validity of that particular truth claim, um, which, uh, you know, leads them to live their lives in a certain way. Um, and, and so these, uh, these subjective spiritual experiences, uh, you know, can also very much be uh, gateways uh, through which people modify their own behavior, right? Um, there's this uh, article, um, I can't remember if it was in Dialogue or Sunstone, but I know it was uh, written by Stephen Carter, um, and it was called uh, Scared Sacred. Um, and he talks about uh, um, uh, both um, Abraham's command to sacrifice Isaac uh, and relates it to Joseph Smith's uh, practice of plural marriage, right? Um, mm -hmm all things that people are typically very uncomfortable with um, when they consider the implications of what was involved. Um, obviously, we have more historical uh, information regarding Joseph's you know, practice of polygamy. Um, but nonetheless, you know, these are, these are actions which shock people, right? And we also hear uh, in, you know, around the world, people committing uh, different acts um, that we might condemn as evil, you know, in the name of religion, religious extremism, violence, terrorism, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And Stephen essentially sets up the argument, um, it, kind of uh, along the lines of, a, a, um, I think, Kierkegaard, um, the, uh, the idea of, like, you know, fear and trembling, that once you have certain experiences, once you encounter the divine or you have uh, some type of experience that you associate with the divine that's just so overpowering, so overwhelming, um, you know, it radically shifts the lens of how you see the world and, you know, thereby certain actions, which in other circumstances you might consider to be irrational or immoral or unacceptable, suddenly you feel like you have no other choice but to commit those, right? Um, and Stephen wasn't uh, seeking to excuse, you know, any of these acts done in the name of religion, um, but just to, you know, point out the, the very real phenomenon that people do have experiences, or at least claim to, right, which then, you know, the way that they make sense of them leads them to act in certain ways, which, you know, uh, for outsiders, um, he poses the question in, in his work, you know, who among us, if we saw Abraham taking Isaac up the hill, you know, no, and we knew that he was going to kill him, of course we would run to stop that, you know, even though it's something that we tell children in our various, you know, religious traditions, uh, you know, a story that we say symbolizes Jesus Christ, or we attribute different meanings to it, you know, and it's like at the end of the story, we're all happy because, you know, uh, Abraham didn't actually sacrifice him, God prevented it. Well, you know, God didn't prevent uh, you know, uh, Joseph from bringing, you know, different women into the marriage bed, right? Um, and so Latter-day Saints have unique things that they need to wrestle with, um, and it, cause, you know, brings into question um, things of uh, epistemology, the validity of religious experiences, you know, um, the ethics of uh, justifying things in the name of religion. I think it's a very poignant piece. Um, is, is the Abraham story something that you will tell your children? And what yeah. lesson would you draw from that? Right. You know, you know that's, a, that's a great question. And it's something that I've considered too, not just Abraham. Am I going to, you know, buy my children, uh, you know, children's books that are all not cute and illustrated with Noah's Ark, you know, all the cute little no, the, the church has already answered this. You can go to Deseret Book and get the yeah. children's Book of Mormon story. Yeah. And the Laban story is just skipped out, outright. They just Wait, don't even go serious? into this. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, I actually oh, wow. I bought a copy of it. It's downstairs in my library. Oh, that's the, you know, they skip that because it's not a good moral. Right. And and this, by the same token, the Abrahamic story is. And so that right. speaks to, you know, the, the underlying theme here of if, you know, 
people do make choices based on what they perceive as real knowledge. And in some cases, if your spiritual worldview is built on false claims, particularly if they give authority to certain people, and in Mormonism that authority has been handed down, it was originally given to Joseph Smith and has been handed down to people who sat in his same seat of power and exist today. Mm -hmm. And you can see the effect of it in how people defer to the brethren, just in terms of, you know, am I okay? Is it okay for me to love my gay son? Well, what do the brethren say? Is mm -hmm. it okay for me to have them in my house, or do I have to say, please don't do that, you know, like President Oaks um, modeled for church members. And it's so fascinating to hear people like yourself, like Marvin Perkins, like other defenders of the church, say that they feel comfortable holding an opinion and a view that's different from prophets because they don't revere prophets in that way when the prophets themselves continually and repeatedly impose the idea that if you are going to please God, if you are going to be good, then you will obey and follow the prophet, even if it goes against your conscience. Right, right. And yeah, that, so to me, that, that concept that you should override your conscience, override logic, to follow men who are simply men, even if they acknowledge that they make mistakes, in one moment and then the next moment say exact obedience brings exact blessings, then it's it's the root problem that they continue to want to have. And frankly, they're happy to let you and other apologists go out and create cloud, ethereal ways of thinking that allow people to continue to subordinate their minds to the brethren because that, that still works for them. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll say to that that um, I mentioned previously that I'm not just in ex-Mormon groups, you know, mm -hmm. sharing these views. I'm in Mormon groups, you know. Um, and so, you know, when I share views, uh, when I am advocating for my particular form of, you know, religion and certain things that I consider to lead to healthy and reasonable and informed religious perspectives and behaviors, um, and, you know, those are things that I share in different Orthodox groups as well. Because, you know, my work is not just with, you know, trying to explain my point of view to ex-Mormons or convince them to come back. Um, I'm not really interested in, you know, convincing ex-Mormons to come back to the church. I'm, I'm interested in people uh, making informed, healthy, reasonable decisions uh, that leads them to, you know, uh, flourish and, you know, achieve, you know, happiness and fulfillment in their life, right? So, I will support a, an ex-Mormon's right to do that, you know, just as much as a, as a Mormon's right. Um, but, you know, I want them to be, to be healthy and, and happy when they do so. Um, so the work that I find myself doing nowadays, uh, largely, um, is, you know, uh, trying to, you know, advocate for these different paradigms within a Mormon worldview, um, so as to help my own faith community, you know, urging them, this is something that, uh, uh, created some, some, you know, maybe dissonance or it was interesting, uh, because th this is how I was on my mission too, um, with different companions in the mission settings, uh, at the MTC, uh, which was the single most hyper orthodox, you know, institutionalized setting I've ever stepped foot in very uncomfortable at times. Um, you know, where the rhetoric that you just described, you know, Exact obedience, you know, brings blessings, you know, you need to follow unconditionally, things like that. Um, I completely disagreed with that approach to Mormonism. And it's something that I often, you know, tried to persuade others to not espouse, you know, and I would reason these are the real issues that come about if you have those kinds of mentalities. It Were you empowered to voice that dissent in the context of the MTC? Yeah. Um, of course, you know, I, I try to be respectful. I try to be um, uh, appropriate and not disruptive. Um, you know, I think there's ways to dis offer dissenting opinions in uh, particular circumstances, such as church and things like that, um, that uh, are, um, you know, they push the boundaries, but they don't do so in a way that comes off as, as hostile or intentionally disruptive or things like that. Um, okay. And well, I so, didn't mean to derail you. I just yeah, it was no, no, surprising no. to hear that. Right. No, it's something that I, I, you know, I would meet with different leaders of the MTC about and express my serious concerns with, um, and uh, on my mission as well. Um, and I, I felt like you know it, 
you know, I had an obligation if uh, someone in those settings asked me a particular religious question, I have an ethical and moral obligation, a spiritual obligation even, to answer them in an honest way, uh, you know, of how I make sense of it, right? Even though there was this pressure to, you know, espouse a, a certain narrative, I felt like I was able to personalize that narrative uh, where I still, you know, believe with or uh, associate or identify with uh, it um, enough to where, you know, I wanted to go on a mission in the first place, right? Um, and I knew what I was getting into. Um, Did but, you know that it was going to be that worth it? I remember when you, you know, in the in the weeks before you got your mission call and before you left for the MTC, a lot of people saying that you're going to run into problems at the MTC and on your mission because of the contrast between your more open perspective and the type yeah. of narrow, rigid <coughs> obedience, obedience, obedience that the MTC uh, drills into people, frankly. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Um, I will say that um, there's a big difference. Uh, here, let me get a drink of water real quick. Sure. Um, yeah, there's a big difference between, um, uh, or, or at least in my experience, there was uh, a noticeable difference between me acknowledging, you know, hey, I've read through Preach My Gospel you know, I've, I've listened to accounts from different missionaries. I know what I'm stepping into, right? There's a difference between, like, reading about something, you know, or hearing about it secondhand or, you know, mentally preparing yourself for it, but then actually experiencing it yourself, right? So there yeah, was... There's also the social dynamics of seeing right, right. everybody around you confirm, <laughs> and suddenly you stand out a lot more. I mean, there are sociology experiments talking about how our brains are programmed to conform in those social settings. So you have to overcome some of the human nature. Yeah. Um, and, and I had read, uh, like Stephen Hassan's, uh, book, um, uh, uh, like, uh, what, what is it like? Com combating. combating mind control. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and, and besides Stephen Hassan, um, you know, I've read other different sociological perspectives on specifically Mormonism or on religion. Right. I already came from a, a unique background, uh, where I had attended a year of school, you know, I've been reading different academic pieces uh, for years now. Um, and so I already felt like I was able to identify mechanisms or uh, particular ways of like rhetoric or speaking or, um, you know, uh, social controls, things like that, uh, that led to particular outcomes. And then the outcome of the MTC, that was largely conformity. It's largely, you know, a particular brand of orthodoxy, um, which, you know, is way more intense than what I would experience, you know, just in my uh, regular church membership. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I felt like in the moment, because I was able to identify those mechanisms, you know, pretty, pretty instantaneously, I was able to, you know, uh, protect myself from them so as to, you know, uh, see them for what they were and what they were trying to achieve, right? I can uh, see you sitting there in class. Oh, okay. So now you're using phobia induction to try to get me to obey. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, now I, you're doing doctrine over self so that you can tell me that my existence is dependent on obedience to you. And, yeah, like, and let me give you an example. I, I, I was told um, once at the MTC that unless we shaved every day, you know, specifically every day, um, I would not be able to learn the Armenian language, that God would not let me learn Armenian. And I'm like... Wow. Yeah, and I'm like, dude, come on, that's BS. Like, come on. <laughs> but that's a perfect way for a naive person to say, to blame themselves when they face up against, you know, a, an obvious difficulty. Right, and you, so you don't have to blame the church, you don't have to blame the lack of the spirit. Yeah, and so, you know, with the companions I was with or different missionaries, um, in a way that was uh, appropriate and wasn't just, you know, flat out, like, um, uh, just trying to be antagonistic or anything like that, you know, uh, we were able to have many uh, very um, constructive uh, conversations where, you know, um, the, the other thing, too, I, I was a pretty obedient missionary, um, but there was, were some things, you know, if there was a rule that I felt was really stupid or restrictive, um, you know, I didn't feel uh, bad for not following it. Um, and one of the main ones was the, the reading list. Um, just given who I am, I love reading. I've always loved it. And to, you know, uh, be told that my information needs to be restricted in some way, you know, for my own well-being, 
that was something that I was just not on board with, right? And uh, you know, um, milieu control, right? Uh, so you know, I would get on the internet and go to uh, the sources. I would go to. I'm talking interpreter. I'm talking. Uh, the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, you know, farms, Faith, faithful like sources, yeah, faithful yeah, sources yeah. that yeah took a no, broad perspective. yeah, no, nothing, nothing that uh, is going to get me removed from a mission by any means. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I'd be able to justify them in one way or another. Um, I also read from like the Society of Biblical Literature and and uh, other like non Latter Day Saint sources, but all things that, you know, I felt like I'd be able to justify, like, I'm learning about the scriptures, this is who I am, blah, blah, blah. It never became a problem, um, but I legit printed off, um, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages in Armenia of these different articles, these essays. Um, I, I printed off probably 15 volumes of dialogue uh, while I was out there, um, and it's one of the few things that, you know, uh, uh, I was able to have that... Uh, really kept me sane um and uh uh it it felt like um a sanctuary at times especially dialogue uh where i was able to uh encounter very different uh uh voices that um espoused a, a mormonism that very much resonated with me um and that's the thing on my mission um i felt like my religious identity my um um uh kind of ties to mormonism uh, very much were deepened. Different things that I, you know, beforehand said that I had a testimony of, I felt like my testimony was strengthened, you know, that uh, my belief in certain aspects of, uh, of my religion uh, were definitely deepened, right? But it didn't, it did not come through reading Preach My Gospel. It did not come through, you know, uh, going through the, the discussions and, and kind of um, uh, reciting in a very formulaic way. Uh, different aspects of an orthodox tes testimony. It came through reading about people like uh, Lowell Benyon, you know, Eugene England, uh, different uh, Mormon makers themselves, right? You know, who yeah. were who were faithful, uh, but yet you know uh, tried to be honest and authentic and and rigorous in their religious life and and uh, uh, have you, well read. Have you done have you done a interview somewhere or a post where you've kind of broken down and deconstructed your mission experience? Cause, I haven't. Uh, um, my mission continues to be um, a complicated thing. Um, you know, it did end a lot uh, quicker than I than I thought it would. Um, and I haven't been able, like, uh, I haven't felt uh, comfortable quite yet talking sure. about it. Well, I appreciate depth. you sharing what you have here, because I don't think I've heard some of the stuff in some yeah, of the other places um, where you've shared stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm in a much better place now than I was um, when I first uh, returned from my mission. Um, I've been able to get closure. I'm planning on studying abroad in Armenia this summer, uh, living in the same areas that uh, I served in. My That'd be great. My friends uh, from the MTC are still serving there, so I'm going to be able to spend time with them and, and go back. And um, I think I'll be living there hopefully for three months um, through ASU. But uh, I hope just besides the, the language studies that I'll be engaged in, uh, that it will really help me to uh, achieve you know, closure and you know, it'll be like a healing thing as well. Um, because my, my mission was simultaneously like the best thing I've ever engaged in, embarked in, um, but also the most maybe traumatic thing, you know, that I've ever encountered as well. Uh, well. I look forward when you get to the point where you can share that side of it. I think particularly to other people who have had mission trauma, mission-related trauma, that um, getting to the point where people feel more comfortable sharing it is kind of one of those things where the more people talk about it, the more they get healing from it, and the more they understand they're not alone. Right. And I think it helps them see perhaps some of the stuff, some of the reactions they had in a more um, permissive, more human way. So I look forward to you getting to the point to where you can do that. Yeah, I'm running, up, I'm like running up against a three hour matter, mark, and I, I have to um, wrap things up a little bit. I did no want worries. to make sure that you. Um, we're open at some point in the future if you wanted to take part in these conversations again. It's much more interesting to me, and I hope full interesting to the audience if I can get something more than all ex-Mormons or all post-Mormons on right. this. And so, um, it's been 
I, I was thank you for extending the grace that you did to being willing to participate in the con conversation. Um, and certainly in the future, if there's anybody else, I mean, hopefully you can tell other voices and personalities that I'd love to have discussions with that I'm not terribly bad, even though some of my videos well, are you're, you're snarky. Nice guy, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to hear Quaku's side of the whole RFM Quaku debacle at some point. Um, oh my gosh, that, so. that might be a stretch. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm glad I was able to come on today. I'd love to have... Uh, more of a heads up uh, in the future. I, I know that uh, this was kind of spur the moment. Um, well, th really this quiet. Friday show is kind of a recap of just what went on. And if yeah. anyone's, you know, it, it's all improv. So yeah. I, um, and I, and I apologize to go. My, that my voice is so uh, messed up. Um, it's yeah, not noticeable I, at all. You're fine. Okay. That's good. Um, it's, it's much deeper than it normally is. I, you know, I'll, I'll let you know. So uh, maybe it's a good thing. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm happy to chat and, uh, um, as far as uh, talking about my mission experience, um, it's really just a matter of like platform and venue now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm debating uh, going, you know, uh, maybe on a couple or, yeah. I mean, I have my own podcast with Sunstone um, that I could easily do it on as well. Um, I I would just want to find the my, the right uh, moderator as well, you know, someone to kind of lead that conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll be considering that um, soon. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks, everybody who joined in. And uh, we should be putting this on a podcast sometime so you can listen by audio only, uh, if I can figure out how to do that in the future. And until next week, this has been Talk on Things and Stuff, and we will see you later.